If you had the chance, would you change the world? Thank you, thank you. There's a little delay. Um, of course you would, because I didn't say save the world. I said change the world, improve it, make it better than we find it. And, and we all want to do that, don't we? And, and great, because I'm here with the, the happy news that you can and you do and you will change the world. But all too often, partly the reason for your hesitation just now, we often think, gosh, changing the world, that's going to be really hard work, perhaps impossible, probably not much fun, and we leave it to someone else, someone really important, they'll do it. And, and, and that's a real shame, because um, we, uh, we, all, uh, we all are capable of changing the world, and I'm going to try and explain how, that, how that's going to work for you individually. No, I'm not going to tell you what to do. Okay, so, so one of the reasons why we tend to hold back that way is to do with the way that we've been taught history. Uh, essentially, we're told that it's about the kind of the things that certain big individuals, usually men, have done over the time. And you know, the great British historian Carlyle once said that history is but the biography of great men. And if you don't happen to think of yourself as a great man already, that may leave you feeling a little bit left out. But luckily, happily, Leo Tolstoy, the novelist, came along, and Tolstoy, this is, this is him in his glory, Tolstoy came along and said that history is more accurately considered to be an infinitely large number of infinitesimally small things that we all do and don't do every day. What, what does that mean? It's easy to understand what he means if you think about an election. You vote for this party, or you vote for that party, or you hate them all, so you don't vote for any of them. But we all know that whatever you do has an effect on the outcome. It, it helps to determine the final result. We all know that. But what Tolstoy is saying is that everything you do and everything you don't do has an effect on how things are. It, has, it shapes the way the, the, the way the world is. Okay, so it's really useful and, and healthy and satisfying to take some responsibility for yourself in, in that sense. So, so what can we do about it? We, we, we want to recognize that we all make history all the time. And if you don't recognize that, if you don't uh, realize what I've just tried to say, you may be one of those people who complains a lot about the status quo. And the status quo is a horrible sort of abstract noun, and it's sort of, nobody likes it, and it feels really oppressive. But if you notice that you have some responsibility, then that's good. So I'm going to offer you another way to think about the status quo, okay? I want you to think instead of a powerful king on the stage. If you like, you can shut your eyes and imagine what's a powerful king on the stage look like. It might be, you know, a really big crown. It might be a golden throne. And I would say, no, those only tell you that he's the king. What makes him powerful? What makes him powerful that all the other people on the stage flat on their faces before him? And if all of those people sat up, stood, sat up, turned their backs on him, went to sleep, told jokes, smoked cigarettes, played the trumpet, it would have a de an enormous effect, wouldn't it? There, there would no longer be a powerful king, even without him doing anything differently. So all of the power comes from those over whom it is exercised. And you can imagine, if you imagine that stage, and you imagine just one of those people getting up and turning their back and playing the trumpet, it would have an amazing, sensational effect, wouldn't it? It's a kind of extraordinary thing. It's like a human version of the butterfly effect that physicists talk of. One flap of the wings, and you have a really distinct change in the weather. And so it's really, really rather, rather wonderful. We can see it when I talk about the stage, but what about in real life? What about in your life, your everyday life? How can you, if you don't like the status quo, how can you get up and turn your back and do something better instead? Well, there are lots of ways. I'm going to come to those. But I want to have a little experiment in this room. I want to see what the human butterfly effect can look like. And what I'm going to ask you to do is one of the most beautiful things that you can do to be a human butterfly, which is to turn to your... Don't do anything yet, OK? Turn to your neighbor, and it's got to be someone you don't already know, so someone behind you or in front of you, and I want you just to smile and say what your name is and introduce yourself, because you don't get to choose your neighbors. The people who are sitting near you are your neighbors. Now, I've, I've explained it, and I'm, I've given you a little bit of extra time, because I know some people are listening on translation. I don't want them to be shocked by you turning around and introducing yourself before they understand. <laughs> OK, so now, if anyone is listening in translation, could you put your hand up to tell me that you've already understood this? OK, thank you. So now, please, just quickly introduce yourself to each other, just now. Off you go. <laughs> Hello, John Paul. Nice. nice to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That's great. What a lovely sight. Thank you. Yes, congratulations to all of you.
Thank you. It's really important to recognize that these neighbors around you are not the ones you chose, but they're the ones you've got. And I'm going to be coming back to that in a second. And it's really lovely to introduce yourself in a friendly way to your neighbors. But it's easy at TED, because everyone here is obviously really lovely. Um, but I want you to promise that when you go home, you will introduce yourself to another neighbor who is not someone who you chose. And just see if you can spread a little bit of the love that way, okay? So that's a little, a little thing you can do. Meanwhile, I want to move on. And I want to talk about certain types of political action we can do, other than saying hello to our neighbors. The great American political scientist, Gene Sharp, uh, has spent a lifetime collecting 198 forms of non-violent political action, an amazing variety. He wants to encourage people to use some of the things that have been used before. And, so he, and he's put down all of these, these forms into basically three groups. Uh, that they are, the first one is highlighting an issue. And that can be drawing attention to an issue that nobody knows about, or it could be drawing attention to an issue that everyone knows about, but they don't take seriously. So highlighting an issue is very important. And we can all do that. I'm sure lots of people in this room have already sort of posted things on Facebook or tweeted about them. And that's very lightweight and very easy, but valuable. Uh, but sometimes highlighting an issue can be really dangerous. So I want to give you, you know, really, really, you're putting yourself at, it's at some risk. So I'm going to tell you about the White Rose Group. That's this group in this picture, who are now national heroes in Germany because they stood up to fascism. And uh, they didn't want to be a part of what, what the Nazi regime were doing, so they sent letters to their fellow citizens. They wrote letters, they, f they pr printed them on a machine, and they sent them at random to people throughout the country whose names and addresses they got from the phone book. Can you imagine the effect when you get one of those letters? And, so, and in order to give themselves the appearance of being a great nationwide network, they also, at great risk, travelled across the country with their printing press and with their letters, so they could send them from Dusseldorf to Cologne and from Dresden to Berlin and Munich, and you get the picture. And so that's what they did. So sometimes just highlighting an issue can be incredibly dangerous stuff. It's, it can be easy, it can be dangerous. The second category is withdrawing your consent from something you disapprove of. So I could tell you about Moses and the Israelites who didn't like the way the Pharaoh was carrying on, and so they got out of Egypt. It was quite simple withdrawal of consent. Uh, but I want to tell you about Rosa Parks, a seamstress who one day in the 1950s decided on the bus in Montgomery, Alabama that she was not going to give up her seats to a white person as the rules required. And one reason why I like her story is that she said she was too tired to go along with the system any longer. So you don't have to be full of energy and enthusiasm to, to change things, you can just be quite tired. Um, but the other, another reason why I like Rosa Parks' story is that, that she didn't actually run everything that happened afterwards. She, that was her thing, she was the spark that led lots of other people in the black community to do amazing stuff, but she didn't run everything. So don't worry, you can start something, and if it's any good, people will follow and they'll take over, and that's okay, you can relax. And the third thing I like about her thing is it started with something very small. It's very hard to believe with hindsight that a lot of people at the time thought that what they were doing was campaigning to change the rules about where black people were allowed to sit on buses in Montgomery, Alabama. Yes! But actually, of course, their, their success and, and their ambition increased over time. So that within a very remarkably short period, they had desegregation across the whole of the United States, which is a previously unthinkable achievement. So you can start with something small and, and you will become more ambitious as a result of it. So that's withdrawing your consent. The third uh, broad category is building a better alternative to what is currently available. So I could tell you about Charles de Gaulle, who set up the French government in exile in the Second World War, but I want to tell you instead about, because uh, he didn't like the one that was in Vichy France, okay. So, but I want to tell you instead about my friend Richard Reynolds, who lives in a tower block in South London, in a rather unattractive part of London, he wouldn't mind me saying that, and he, uh, he lives in a, a high floor, so he doesn't have a garden, and so one day he'd started to go downstairs and look around in the area where he lived, and he found bits of earth, and he would put plants down, and, they weren't, and, and he wasn't a very good gardener, so some of the plants died, but he got better, and some of the plants survived, and then some of his friends joined in, and then uh, complete strangers joined in, and then um, the, the local authorities said, you can't do that, it's not your land, but they carried on anyway, because they're guerrilla gardeners, you see, and Richard is the leader of the worldwide guerrilla gardening movement, and if you look him up online, he is Richard001. And, but, but the thing is, the, the reason why I mention this story is that anything you do can be an inspirational example to someone else, okay? And Richard is an inspirational example, he's a leader. One other little thing I'd like to point out about Richard is his great blessing is he doesn't have a garden. If he'd had a garden, he wouldn't be a gorilla gardener, would he? So the thing that you see as a lack or a shortcoming could be the thing that's really the making of you. So that's quite an encouraging thought, isn't it? So all of these people can be an inspiring example. I've taken great care to tell you about things like, you know, desegregation or fighting fascism, which is sort of terribly important, but also to tell you about someone who just wants to do some gardening. Because when you're changing the world, it doesn't have to be changing the whole world in something that you perceive to be really important. It could be just changing your world in a way to make it better. And gardening is fine. So what are you going to do? I'm not going to tell you. 
often we feel that we're impaled on a kind of a paradox. We really want to do something, but we have no idea what it's going to be. And one way to resolve that is to think about the things that you enjoy. And so, I want you to think about that. The positive psychologists, the positive psychologists are people who have got fed up with being negative psychologists and saying what's wrong with people. They wanted to find out what's great about people and share that knowledge. And so they did a test. One of the things they did, they sent out two groups of people to find out what gives people pleasure. And the first lot were sent to do hedonism, if you like, having a foot massage while eating chocolate. And the second group were sent out to do something meaningful, meaningful to them, I'll come back to that. And the results came in and the people who'd done something meaningful had a much deeper and longer lasting sense of satisfaction than the ones who'd done the hedonism. That something about them had changed inside. They thought, I'm the sort of person who does that thing, uh, which is nice. And so, you know, changing the world is actually nicer than having a foot massage and eating chocolate. Uh, but, what, but the thing is, what is something meaningful? Well, I could, I, you impose the meaning on what you do, not me. I can't tell you what's meaningful. I can give you an example. You could walk your neighbor's dog and feel really resentful, and I really hate the whole thing, and just not really be happy about it. Or you could walk your neighbor's dog because your neighbor's unwell, and you know that they'd feel really, really happy for you having done it. And so you'd feel all puffed up with joy, and you'd feel like a really great person. So the same thing can be either good or bad. You impose a meaning, not me. So you need to think what actually is something meaningful to you. And one way to do that is to ask yourself, what have you done in the past to make a difference that made you feel good? And what are the dreams that you've had? But if you really want to cut to the absolute nub of the issue, you must ask yourself this question. What would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? As if success was magically guaranteed. It's important to ask the question in that way. So you get rid of the boring answers that are sort of achievable, that you don't really want to do them. Go for the one that's absolutely sensational and you're really passionate about because then you will persist with it. Okay, so do do that. Ask yourself that question. Keep that question from now till the rest of your lives. And then once you've come up with an answer, I hope it'll be something so magnificent you're almost embarrassed to tell anybody because it's so great. And then there is a danger. What, what might happen then is you'll put it on a shrine and it'll be like an icon or it'll be like a beautifully, a beautiful painting that's been beautifully painted and it's got a beautiful frame and you know just where it's going to go in the hallway at home, um, but nobody's painting it, so it's not going to happen. And you're using static thinking. We, mean, we might want to move away from static thinking to process thinking. Instead of thinking about the end result, start thinking about it as a process. And one person who can help us with that is the German philosopher Nietzsche, who said, not every end is a goal. The end of a melody is not a goal. He's got a point, but what does he mean? Well, if you go to a concert, you don't say, I wish this music would finish and then I could really enjoy it. You, you enjoy it as it goes along. So, so start thinking about your mission instead as, as a piece of music, okay? It's already started. Can you hear it? I, I think it sounds great. Uh, so, so that's what you want to do. What's great about noticing that it's a process instead of an end result that you're after is you then liberate yourself to stop being freaked out by the sheer monumental scale of what you want to do and you enjoy every step because no one did anything in all of humankind except in small steps. Neil Armstrong didn't wake up one morning and say, I'm going to the moon now. Lots of people had to go to the office um, so, and do stuff. So, so we can all do that. We have to notice the small steps. And the great thing about small steps is they give you courage. They're mini victories. They move you on to the next small step. It's not quite so small. And so you can use those as a way to encourage yourself. So you've got your mission. You've got the need to, to find small steps. But if you really want to pin down the small steps, ask yourself this question. What can you do in the next 24 hours? Because if you can't do anything in the next 24 hours, what makes you think you will ever start? Okay, so, so you've got the mission, you've got the small steps, and now you're going, to have some, you're going to need to find some allies. You're not going to do much all on your own. So one way you can do that is to try and draw a map of your support network, the people you already know. Do it like this. Put yourself in the middle, put the names of people around the edge who give you support and to whom you give support. So on this one, you can see I'm giving a lot of support to William. He's giving me nothing back. What do I do about that? I'll have to work it out. But the, the, supports, the, the relationships that are most useful, and psychologists use this with the addicts and alcoholics and so on, are the ones that are reciprocal. So you can see Sonia and Ben are both reciprocal relationships. So you might want to draw this map, it's quite interesting. And then go and ask those people for help. You must actually ask them to help you. You might think, I can't ask, that's awful, that real imposition. But people like to be asked because it means that they're wise and, and kind and generous and sensitive. Um, but the only reason people don't like to be asked is when they can't see a way to say no. So you say to them, will you help? And by the way, if you can't, either now or at any time in the future, I really don't mind, and you have to mean it. And once you've asked them in that way, why would they say no? And what you've done then is liberate them to be an active part of your mission. They will want to do things for, to really be part of it. And they'll phone you up and say they've seen something in the newspaper. So that's great. You may also find that there are other people, sort of activists all over the country. This is my country, uh, the UK. Um, you may find people spread all over the place, and you can go and find some of those. And I want to end by giving you uh, some account of my own experiences, because I feel it would be a bit dishonest to stand in front of you and say, anyone can change the world, 
if I didn't try to say something about what I, what I, how I have tried to do. So uh, f some years ago, I got really freaked out, very seriously freaked out. I was very depressed about climate change and peak oil, uh, the, the cli resource shortages that are coming. And I didn't know what to do. I thought, we've got to change the whole way that everyone lives. We've got to get much more self-sufficient, more resourceful, stop flying things around the world. Everyone's got to start making their own f growing their own food. They've got to start making their own clothes, uh, doing all sorts of things like that. So I joined all the campaign groups you can imagine, and they were wonderful, and we did some great stuff, you know, joining these networks nationwide. Um, and after about a year, I realized we were doing some amazing stuff, but I was seeing all the same faces, lovely faces, but all the same faces. And I wanted everybody to change, not just the, the seasoned campaigners. And I happened around then to read a book by Alistair McIntosh, which talks about how it's no good being a campaigner if you're not a good neighbor. And it kind of hit me in the head right there. So you know why I've now asked you to think of each other as neighbors. I thought, what, what can I do with this? How? And so I kind of resigned from these campaign groups, and I went to work on my street. And I, and I had an allotment where I was growing my own food, and so I went to the allotment, filled a sack full of apples, and I went home, and I have a wonderful, beautiful wife and a wonderful, beautiful daughter, little daughter at the time, and Nancy. And so I, I grabbed Nancy's hand, and I didn't need to take Nancy, but she gave me courage, basically. And so I took the sack and the apples, and I and carried Nancy along with me. And we knocked on every door, and, and people opened the door. And I said, I'd taken the risk that people, that, you know, a man with apples and a, and a lovely daughter isn't a big threat. And, and they opened the door, and they took the apples. And so that was nice, and I got to know people a bit better. And then um, the, the sneaky bit was six months later, but forgive me, because it came from the right place. I deliberately grew too many tomato seedlings. And uh, I put them all in a box, and I grabbed Nancy's lovely hand again. And uh, we walked along the street, and I knocked on the doors, and, and we said hello, and I told oh, Nancy again, and they said hello. And, they, and I said, oh dear, I've got too many tomato seedlings, and I gave it to them, um, and, and they took them. And I know for a fact that many people in my street that year, for the first time, started growing food. So I hadn't had to sort of freak them out about climate change or, or resource shortages. I just got them growing a, a, a plant. That was kind of the solution. So I was very lucky it was possible in that way uh, to find the happy solution that way. And Nancy drew a picture recently. This is a reenactment for you. Um, so I had, happened, I had been lucky, and by chance I discovered something that's really important, which is you could try to emphasize the positive. Okay? Because as the late philosopher Raymond Williams once said, the key is not to make despair convincing, but to make hope possible. You are on a journey. It starts now, and you might as well make it fun. Thank you. <laughs>